welcome to Ingle Farm Savage Army. We are so glad that you're joining with us today and we pray that as you engage with the worship with us, that you would be blessed, that God would speak to you and that in these moments, you would find rest and restoration for your soul. We're really excited today as we uh, join in on a service that the New South Wales ACT division um, shared only a couple of weeks ago called Eyes High. And uh, we're really excited as we as we join in that service this morning. And we pray that it would um, it would encourage you to keep your eyes high, keep your eyes high fixed on Jesus as we look to him, the author and perfecter of our faith. We're excited for what is in store for us this morning. And uh, we pray that whenever you have a chance to, to join in worship with us, wherever you may be from, um, that you would be encouraged today. Let's pray together as uh, we head into this gathering, this service. Together. Lord, we thank you for this day. It's the day that you've made and we choose to rejoice and to be glad in it. And Father, we just pray as we gather, uh, although distant, that Father would feel united in spirit. Holy Spirit, we pray that you do a new work in our lives, uh, just awaken our hearts to the things that are on your heart. And Father, I just pray that we'd be refreshed, restored, renewed as we spend time in your presence, intentionally in your presence just now, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yama, listen up, I've got something really important to say. My name is Sue Hodges. I am a Wiradjuri woman and I live here on a Wabiko country. I'd like to acknowledge our great creator who gave custodianship to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait people who take care of this beautiful land. I'd like to acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging. And I would like to welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. One, two, three, four. So you are my vision. You are my vision, oh King.
cross my light to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. to be together in this way today and what a time it has been. I wonder if you've ever felt a little bit like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They were thrown into a furnace for what they believed but the interesting thing is they didn't burn up and they came out unscathed. Let me just read you the passage and remind you. It says, 
Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, prefects, governors and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was the hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched and there was no smell of fire on them. What an amazing story. This great God allowed them to go through the furnace, but they came out unscathed. He did a miracle and there was not a smell of smoke on them. Now, in this time, friends, we can come out with smelling of smoke everywhere, a little bitter about the experience, or we can come out praising God because he's done an amazing miracle. That's not saying it hasn't been tough. It has, hasn't it? It's been really, really difficult. It's been a crisis. And we've had to go through COVID. We've seen things happening in our Salvation Army that we thought perhaps might never happen. We've been impacted by finances. We've lost people that we've loved and how difficult that has been. And yet they come out with not a smell of smoke on them. I would pray that that will be our experience during this time. Jim Collin reminds us that in a crisis, there is always the end. So yes, it's been difficult. It's been like a furnace and God has been with us. You have done amazing things. You've been church without walls. You've been caring, creative, connected. You've been real community. And I can't help but say thank you, thank you, thank you. These might very well be amazing days for the church if we can grab hold of them. And that would be my prayer for us right now, that we will grab hold of this. We're not going back to normal. There's no going back to normal. The days will keep on changing. It's already been estimated that in the USA, there are 30 to 40% down on the number of people who are now attending church. Some people are not coming back. Some people are not coming back till there's a vaccine. So this is a good time for God to say to us, I want you to reset. I want you to think through what church is really about. I want you to think through how you find the way to be the church, not do church. So what are we going to keep? What are we going to drop? What are we going to start? What are we going to learn from God during this time so that we come out with not a smell of smoke on us, that we are rejoicing in the miracles that God does. So what do we want to keep? What do we want to create? Spiritual renewal is so key right now. Hope you're staying real close to Jesus. It's given us time, hasn't it, to create new rhythms. I've loved that. I've uh, spent a whole lot of time instead of racing to Redfern or Auburn early in the morning, just spending time with Jesus, going on walks, creating new rhythms, making sure I have a Sabbath. We're going to keep unity like never before. We need to come together to see the world transformed by Jesus. We're going to be an army that's on its knees, rising up, moving forward, really seeking him, seeing the world transformed. Aussies, one life at a time with the love of Jesus. We're going to be a people who go deep in that spiritual renewal. And discipleship huddles. We're going to be people who are disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. Who are we taking the journey with? Who are we really impacting on the journey so that we might be strong disciples in a world that absolutely knows Jesus? We're going to share the gospel. We're going to talk about what Jesus is saying in the gospels. What are you saying to us, Lord? What do you want us to do with what you're saying? They're important questions, aren't they? And imagine as each one of us takes someone else on that journey. We want every salvo to be on mission. We were never to be a sitting army. We come together on Sunday so that we can then in, enter the mission field as soon as we go out. Some of you have seen this little card that's the one, one, one. We're going to gather for one worship service. We're going to grow in one discipleship huddle. We're going to go and serve one meeting together 
one discipleship huddle, one ministry. Imagine when every salvo again is doing those things. Then we're going to find new ways to do church. We're going to be the church. We're not going to go to church. So we're going to talk about different ways of doing church. Spiritual renewal, partnering up. I love what God is doing in that space as we partner with others and we see what he's got for us. And living a Jesus culture. Don't want a culture of whinging. We want a Jesus culture where we live like Jesus, where we live for Jesus. So, friends, today, where you're going to come out of that furnace with the smell of smoke on you or not a hint of it because we've seen God do miracles. Eyes high. We are taking new ground. I'm so excited about that. New things are rising up. If I had time, I could tell you hundreds of stories of what God has been doing in this time. Speak it up. Share it. Celebrate it because God is doing the new things. We can have eyes high. We are advancing. We're not retreating. Have you got that? We're advancing. We're not retreating. Come on, let's go. Well, hello, everybody. Let me begin uh, by greeting you here from sunny England uh, of the four days over the English summer. Actually, the sun shines. That is today. So greetings from sunny England and from London. Uh, my name is Phil Wall. Uh, I'm a salvationist from uh, the UK. And uh, it's my real privilege to be able to uh, join with you today and share God's word with you in your session this morning. And um, a little bit about me, uh, background, I've I, uh, been in the Salvation Army all my life, often describe myself as a fetal Salvationist. Um, I was born into it, my parents are Salvation Army officers, uh, but I came to real living faith when I was 20 years of age, when someone shared with me the reality of uh, the historicity of the risen Jesus. And that event and that moment and that fact of history changed my life. And so ever since that time, I've been very passionate about sharing with others something of that story. And so I've been asked to share today something from God's word with you as you celebrate this special weekend together, uh, this eyes high, taking more ground uh, themed event. And I hope that what I have to say is of help to you. Of course, it's an extraordinary time uh, that we're living in. Even those of you much older than I uh, who went through the war years would probably say we've never, ever been through anything quite like this, where on a global scale, people's lives appeared to have changed forever. And one of the phrases I hear a great deal these days is when people say, well, of course, there's this whole new world. The old world is gone. The new world is here. The post or kind of current COVID world is here. But the truth, of course, is the exact opposite. This isn't the new world. This is actually very much the old world. We are possibly the first or kind of couple of generations back who lived our lives with no expectation of any kind of pandemic that could have a significant impact on most of our lives. Whereas actually throughout all of human history, up until relatively recently, that has not only been an expectation, but it's also been a regular event. And what I want to share with you today are some words from uh, the book of Mark, uh, where it actually talks about one of those contagions, one of those pandemics that had quite a profound effect on the lives of many people in the ancient world. So I'm going to be reading to you, get my glasses if I may, uh, from uh, Mark uh, chapter 1. And uh, the beginning of Mark, Mark we think is uh, the words of Peter. Peter is basically reciting uh, to um, uh, uh, the, the writer uh, Mark uh, and just telling him the story. And that the book of Mark is designed really for, for, for non-Jews, for Gentiles, for people like you and I, people born outside of the nation of Israel and the people of Israel. And it's designed to kind of highlight the key events in the life of Jesus that make clear to the world and to the Jewish world that this is the Messiah and this is the answer to all of the questions the life in life that people have ever asked that are answered in his life, his death, and then his historical resurrection. And so chapter one of the book of Mark, what's been happening is Jesus has been gathering some followers. He's been around healing people. Some amazing things have taken place. And uh, they get up in the morning, his followers, and they can't find him anywhere. Anyway, they find him out on the hillside praying. They say, Jesus, what are you doing? This is just amazing. All those people you healed, more people have come to you. And then Jesus says, no, he said, we must go because I must go preach throughout the other villages about the kingdom of God, because that is why I've come. So it's then it's when it's on his way to these other villages that in Mark chapter one, verse 40, that this little story, this profound story that has so much to say to our age and our world takes place. 
Mark chapter 1, verse 40. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, he says, you can heal me and make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. Then Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. As a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming to him. So here we have a story. It's a story about a virus, well not so much a virus, a story about bacteria. But it's also a story about another virus, which I want to call the virus of grace, the grace virus. And uh, I want us to really just ask two very simple questions. Number one, what's happening? And number two, what can we learn? So the first thing is, what's happening? What's taking place? Well, the passage begins by saying, a leper came to Jesus. Leper, leprosy, is a bacterial condition that affects the nervous system, that eventually destroys the joints and the limbs all over the body. You would have seen possibly in school lessons or, or, or in other situations, stories whereby lepers uh, would lose their thumbs and, and, and the extremities, parts of their face, their ears, their nose. You would have heard, if you've been in the Salvation Army for many years, our stories of how the Salvation Army served people in leper colonies. That's part of our kind of iconic narrative that we have about ourselves. And this man was part of a leper colony. And lepers, when they became lepers, when they contracted leprosy, immediately they were shoved and forced into a world of utter exclusion. They were excluded physically because from that point onwards, they could never touch anybody ever again. All touch was gone. They were excluded uh, socially. They were rejected. They were sent away from their home, away from their town, often outside of the city walls to where the leper colony uh, would live and suffer and die together. They were excluded relationally. They would have lost their family, their wife, their children, their mum, their dad, their brothers and sisters. All that kinship, all that would have been gone. They couldn't stay around them for fear of possibly infecting them. They would have been professionally excluded. Their job would have gone. They might have been a farmer or a carpenter. They might have uh, been a fisherman. But at that point, once they were a leper, that was taken away from them. Also religiously, because they were excluded from the community, they were excluded from religious expression and from going to the temple or to the synagogue to actually engage in worship to God. And it went even beyond that. I understand that actually leprosy can affect also the sight and the voice box, that actually the exclusion went way beyond just social exclusion, but also exclusion of communication and of hearing. Both sight and sound were also often lost. They found themselves utterly excluded and utterly cut off. And they were told every single day to do something which made sure that that carried on by literally walking around saying the words, unclean, unclean, and even wearing a bell so that people could hear them coming and not come anywhere near them. So this is a man in a desperate situation who actually probably under threat of death came into the town because you weren't allowed to come in in case you had infected others. But for whatever reason, he'd heard about Jesus. Something had grabbed him. And so he came and threw himself in front of Jesus and said, Master, if you are willing to take pity on someone like me, you can make me clean. And of course, leprosy wasn't just a disease. To be a leper wasn't just to be a person who had a certain disease. To be a leper was to have a new identity. They just didn't have leprosy. They were a leper and they became defined by something that was wrong with them. Quite a few years ago, I was involved in a Salvation Army event that uh, it meant taking worship out onto the public streets of London. And uh, on one particular day, uh, one of these events, we're walking down uh, the, uh, the street and I saw this man quite disheveled sitting on the side of the road. So being an extrovert that I am and always looking for opportunities to talk to other people about Jesus, I sat down next to this man as the march, the many thousands of people marched on by. 
We began his talk and he began to tell me something of this tragic story of, of rejection and depression and, and of abuse he suffered as a child. And here he was, a fully fledged and deeply committed, it seemed, heroin addict. So we talked for about half an hour. And kind of about halfway through that, I began to talk about Jesus. And he'd been raised uh, around uh, church life as a kid. And so he knew the story, knew what it was about. And at one point, he looked me in the eye and said something which kind of stopped me in my call. He said, Phil, he says, I know the story. And I accept that the best thing that I could do for my life would be to commit myself to follow Jesus. He said, but you need to understand. He said, I don't just take heroin. I am a heroin addict. And my fear is that if I cease to be that, I'll lose so much of who I am and so many of the people that bring meaning into my life. Being a heroin addict for him wasn't just a condition, it was his identity. He was identified by something that was wrong with him. But of course, it's not only people like lepers and people like heroin addicts that have that challenge. Many people, many middle class people, many middle class people that go to Salvation Army churches and have been going to them for many, many years have the exact same challenge. Too often their lives are defined at a very deep, deep level by those things that are wrong with them. Their besetting sin, those things that they often find themselves falling into. Their failures, their fears, their deep, deep anxieties. And there's much of that around at the moment. Those broken relationships, those lost marriages, those lost children. Those things that have actually begun to define them and shatter their personal self-confidence. The sense of rejection that people feel, the rejection that people fear. All of these things often add up that for many people, for many people that are church people, faith people, Salvation Army people, actually at a very deep psychological level, find themselves, define themselves, not by who Jesus is or by what Jesus has done, but why actually what's wrong with them. And the great news is, as Jesus had good news for that man those years ago, he has great news for you and I. So what happens next? Well, it says that Jesus says, I am willing. And then it says he touched him. Now, it might be obvious, but let's just go back. And of course, we know lots about this in the era of coronavirus. You didn't touch. You don't touch. You have always significant social distancing. That's how you kept safe from leprosy. And although you might shout at people from a distance and you might be appropriately social distance from probably quite a few metres rather than just two, as it is in the UK at the moment. The one thing you didn't do to a leper was touch them. And this man who hadn't been touched by another human being since he was first infected or his infection was discovered was suddenly touched by the living God. And it changed him. But it didn't just change him. At that moment, the universe changed. See, I'm no academic, really, but I do understand some things about physics. I do understand, for example, some things about the laws of thermodynamics. And what the laws of thermodynamics means is that, for example, if you have a piece of fruit and you put it on the side and you just leave it there uh, for a while, it will, over a relatively short period of time, begin to degrade and break down. It will go from order into chaos. It will go from structure into deconstruction and it will become a rotten apple. If you then take that apple and you put that into a bowl of other apples, healthy apples, new apples, what won't happen is that the bad apple will get made into a good apple by the good ones. What will happen is that the bad apple, the toxic apple, the apple with all those disgusting little kind of viral loads within them, will begin to infect the good apple. And that's the way universe works. That's the way physics and nature works. And at this point in, and this moment in this story, Jesus changes the universe, whereby something that would normally be made unclean by touching something unclean. In this amazing story, something that is clean touches something unclean and makes it clean. Not only did Jesus change his life, but at that point, the universe and our understanding of it changed and changed forever. And our society is filled with women. It's filled with men. Our Salvation Army buildings, our churches, our communities are filled with women and are filled with men who, like that man, need something of a healing touch from Jesus. 
because we have within us this kind of perverse, toxic defining of ourselves, not by who he is or by what he's done in our lives or by how we've been made in his image and are his beautiful creation, but by what we see wrong about us, by wrong things that we've done or wrong things that have been done to us or by the failures or the fears or the uncertainties and the insecurities. We begin to define ourselves too often, not by him and the things that he's made right about us, but we define ourselves too often like the leper by the things that are wrong with us. And the great news is, as we said a moment ago, that Jesus had an answer for him, so he has an answer for us. But I find this last little bit of the story really very, very interesting. So Jesus, having touched him, he didn't need to touch him. He could have just spoken to him. This is the God man, the God that spoke the universe into being, the God that spoke healing onto all others and said, just be clean. But on this situation, because of the profound nature of leprosy and the exclusion of any kind of touch, he touched him. He met his greatest, not just his physical health need, but his greatest human need. He needed human touch and intimacy and in that miraculous moment and the lord knows what it must have been it must have been extraordinary jesus then said hey whatever you do don't tell anybody but go and see the priest tell the priest what has happened make an offering that's appropriate for this kind of thing that god has done in your life but whatever you do don't tell anybody and then there is this extraordinary moment and this i think is a really interesting theological question will this man be judged by god for his disobedience because at that moment, he is so overwhelmed by the extravagance and the generosity and the love and the kindness and the grace that has changed his life. He just can't help himself and has to go and tells everybody. So much so that Jesus himself can't go anymore into the towns because there are so many people looking for him. So he has to hide away in the excluded places. And this man that has spent years in exclusion by his just overwhelming, uncontrollable thankfulness and joy for what God's done in his life ends up excluding the Son of God himself from actually the urban places where all the people were. I wonder if in some bizarre way, having been given a direct command, and most of us haven't had that, but a direct command from the living God himself, do not do this, does the exact opposite and disobeys. I wonder if you'll ever actually be judged by that or whether or not the loving God would just look and smile and laugh at what was basically just an overwhelming, uncontrollable response of someone so thankful to God for what he'd done in, their, in his life. And I got to wonder as I read this story, and I know so much of uh, what uh, you as a community want as you think uh, during uh, these hours you're spending together, is how is it that in this time of national and international crisis, how can we more be the church that Jesus created us and called us to be? How can we more be the bride of Christ? How can we more be that living embodiment of who he is and what he's about and what he has said and what he has? How can we be those people? And one of the great tragedies of churches, and I've been privileged uh, to spend uh, quite a long time working for the Salvation Army as a preacher, as I did in the 90s, and I was privileged to travel all over the world speaking about Jesus, not just in Salvation Army churches, but in lots of other churches as well. And one of the great tragedies or travesties, and maybe one of the great challenges as we as a church seek to figure out how we're going to respond and serve our communities in a time like this, is actually so many of people that find themselves very regular on a very committed basis in churches aren't motivated to share that story because actually deep, deep down, they don't think they have a story to tell. They're not like this leper guy who just felt overwhelmed by what had gone on. He just wanted to tell everybody the good news about Jesus. And I have no clue what we should do about all that's happening with COVID at the moment. I really have no idea. I find it very easy to sit in judgment of our politicians, but actually in truth, I really don't know what the right thing to do is. What I do know though, is that one of the things that the church should be doing is sharing and showing and loving and telling the transformating grace-filled virus story of Jesus. And sometimes we don't do that. And the reason we don't do that it's because up until this point, we've not yet experienced what Jesus wants to do in us and in our lives. Too easily, like the left, we've defined ourselves and allowed ourselves to be defined by those things that are wrong with us. 
our hang-ups, our fears, our uncertainties, those things that stop us being set free by the profound and the life-changing message and power of Jesus. And if we were, like the leper, we want to tell everybody. We want to tell everybody. I've been raised in the Salvation Army, maybe like many of you, but I remember and I heard a teenager once describe it as the holiness meeting from hell in this particular event. But when we sing that song, I have led lots of Salvation Army meetings and I've stood on platforms leading this song and some said, let's have this song. And the song goes like this. Joy, joy, joy. There is joy in the Salvation Army. Hallelujah. And often as I've been listening to that song and I'm looking at, I want to scream at people, tell your faces that truth. <laughs> because joy is not what's exuding from you. And I wonder why that is. And the lesson of church history so often is, it's not because these are bad people. It's not because they don't have things at life for which they could be happy and joyful about. It's because up until that point, they have not experienced the life transforming, grace filled power of Jesus at work in their lives. And this event, in many ways, is about how do we take new ground? How do we lift our eyes to look at Jesus? And how do we, by his grace and in his power, be instruments of change, be change agents within our society during this critical time? And as I thought about that, as I thought about what would be most helpful to share today, it seems to me that journey for some of you watching this, maybe many of you watching this, begins with a fresh and new encounter with the risen Jesus. Because of what Jesus desires to do for all the people in your community, in your state, in your country, is to come and touch and transform the brokenness in so many of their lives, to come and bring healing to the hurt and the pain and all those things by which too often people have defined themselves by what is wrong with them, just like the leper and the heroin addict, and kiss that hurt and that pain and bring his transformation. And maybe as you pause to reflect, as you pray, as you ask God, how do we serve? How do we react and respond to this in our communities? That journey will begin by you experiencing something of a kiss something of a healing transformation of God at work in your own life. I love movies. In fact, probably one of my hobbies in life is actually watching movies. I love them. And uh, one of the movies I really enjoyed was a movie called Slumdog Millionaire. And it was really the story of two young people, a, a young boy called Jamal uh, and a long, young lady called Latik. And you see that at the beginning of the journey that began, you see the story of these two small children playing, boys just having lots and lots of fun, but born into desperate poverty. And then their lives go on different journeys and he begins to get a job and, uh, and starts to try and take responsibility for his own life and lives of others. And then goes on this amazing journey and enters the kind of uh, who wants to meet a millionaire type conversation. She very sadly gets trafficked and gets wrapped up in a prostitution ring. And as part of this, because on one occasion she tried to escape, she gets cut down the side of her face with a knife. So it leaves this huge great scar. Anyway, at the end of the story, there is a wonderful, it's a wonderful kind of Bollywood, Hollywood ending to the story. Um, they see each other, they're looking for each other and they see each other in this train station and they walk towards each other and they embrace. And Jamal looks down and uh, the uh, Latik looks up in his eyes and he suddenly sees this big scar on her face and she hides her head and drops her head in shame. And at that moment, Jamal lifts her chin and kisses her scar. He kisses that thing which is the cause of her pain, which is the cause of her shame, which is the cause of her fear and her anxiety and often her rejection from the community she sought to be part of. He kisses that place of greatest pain in her life and he brings healing and wholeness as he expresses unconditional love. And as I'm watching this movie, I'm going, that's a Jesus moment. That's a Jesus story because that's what Jesus did. He kisses our pain and he brings healing and wholeness. And so I want to encourage you today. I'm going to pray if I may in a moment. That as you spend this time together, as you begin and reflect as a church community, to think about how might we best be the body of Christ, the salvation army in this day, in this age, at this time. That for you, it begins like it began with a leper, with a new and a fresh and a healing encounter with Jesus. He is good news. He has lavished his love upon us. And he's waiting for you to come to him as the leopard and said, Jesus, would you please heal me? 
And the answer to the leper with the same answer to you. Yes, that's what Jesus wants to do. And as he heals us and kisses our pain, he then enables us as healed, wounded, healer type people to go out and serve and save and share that glorious transformational message that there is a God who loves the world with an unconditional, lavish love that he wants every man and every woman and every child to know him. And it's our job to tell him. Let me pray. Lord Jesus Christ, um, this message will travel many thousands of miles before it's heard. I just want to pray that something of your word would really resonate in the hearts of any hurting, broken, fractured people that are watching it. I pray for those that are fearful. I pray for those that are anxious. I pray for those that have lost hope. I pray for those that find themselves excluded from families or relationships or, or from workplaces, that Jesus, on this day, as they gather as a community of people, you would meet them. And as they look into your eyes, as they, as they get their eyes high and look up into your eyes as that leper did those years ago, you would touch them and you would heal them. Not just because of that healing sake, Jesus, but because as healed people, we then are able to go out and share that glorious story with a hurt and broken world that is so desperately in need of you. So by your grace and by your strength, would you help us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you beautiful people in Australia. God bless. Bye-bye. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, with hearts full of gratitude for what you are and who you are to each one of us. Father God, you are a great God. We love you and we adore you. We worship you, Father, for all your goodness and your protection over each one of us. Father God, you brought the Salvation Army into this world through our dear founders. And Lord, this Salvation Army has helped all over the world for people to come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Father God, in these days when we have troubles and worries and temptations and the pandemic, Father God, we just pray that you will use your Salvation Army, which you brought up for with a great purpose of saving the world for you and bringing out saints and helping the poor people who do not have much to have as their own Lord. Father, I thank you for the Salvation Army and I thank you for the opportunity you gave me as your servant to serve you in many parts of this, your world, Lord that I could bring many to your kingdom and add them to your family. Father God, right now our need is for your wisdom, your guidance, your love, your protection for all our people and especially for our leaders, Lord. Give them the wisdom, Jesus. Help them to put you first and your kingdom, Lord, that we will be able to bless the people who come across Whoever who enters into the portals of the Salvation Army, a little core, a big core, a big center for the God, wherever it is, Lord, let your name be honored and glorified. Father, we also pray that you want us to be your hands and your legs, and you want us to roll up our sleeves and do things for you and for your kingdom. Father, we really pray that when we are around the people, Lord, let them see Jesus in us, Lord, that they will be able to come to us for need, for help, for prayer, for love, for fellowship, and to be part of our family. Father God, I thank you because the Salvation Army has kept its hands wide open for anyone to come. As you have said, Lord, come all ye who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And Father God, I pray that you will help each salvationist from a young soldier to the older folks, that we will be able to be friends to everyone who comes in, Lord. Give us the wisdom, Lord, especially to our leaders, our commanding officers, our institutional leaders. Father God, we pray that we will be children of God. We will be the army of Jesus Christ, our captain, that will fight against sin and bring sinners in, Lord. Father, we pray 
Let us be the fragrance of your love. Let us be the helping hand, Lord, to people who need help. Father, use us mightily for your glory. And you said, Lord, if we ask anything in your name for your glory, you will do it. And so, Father, we cling on to that promise. And we pray, Jesus, that you will use us mightily in these days when people need comfort and solace and peace. Father, we love you. We give you for every opportunity which comes our way, Lord. Help us to grab it with our both hands so we can glorify you. So let your name be honored and glorified, Lord. Keep us faithful, Father. Let our faith be strong. Come what may, we will stand for you. Lord, I bless you for this country of Australia. Father, I pray, I pray for all the people, especially our Prime Minister and all the Premiers. Father, it's a difficult time for us to do what is right and not to do what is wrong. So I pray, Father, that you will be with them, giving them the wisdom. Father, I also pray for all the Christendom, Lord, all the Christian churches, the so-called Christians. Father, your word says, if those who are called by your name will humble ourselves and seek your face and turn from our wickedness, you will hear our prayer and you will heal the land. Lord, I claim this promise for Australia and for the whole world that your name will be honored and glorified. Your name has the healing, Lord. Your name can break the chains, Father. And so, Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity that everyone has in the ranks of the Salvation Army and in the soldiership, Lord, that we will be able to glorify your name. Father, give us all wisdom, and especially wisdom for our leaders. Let your name be glorified, Lord. Lord, we adore you. We love you, Father. Let all your name be glorified. Honor and gratefulness only belongs to you, Jesus. I ask all these things in the mighty and matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, thank you for sharing with us this morning. What a great morning it's been, and it's great to be together in this way. I want to say to you, as we share in a benediction this morning, you are the people of hope. God has put that into every single one of us. And so as the people of God, as the people of great hope, you will be hope bringers, hope givers in a world that desperately needs that right now. And I'd like to read that verse from Romans. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that as we go from here, that even though it's been a difficult time, felt like the furnace sometimes, hasn't it? And yet this God of miracles still continues to bring us through with not a smell of smoke on us. So go out in that way to bless the people that you serve, that you meet with every single day.
children and their children and make his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going your weeping and rejoicing he is for you for you, he's for you, he's for you. 